So in this presentation, I would like to present to you our findings. And I think I will have a, a kind of an overview that kind nicely uh, uh, shows the same kind of things that uh, uh, Meta has been showing in the previous presentation, uh, but with a slightly more general uh, uh, overview. Uh, let's see. This is not working, so I will do it like so. So let's start at where we came from. We, uh, museums in the old days showed all their objects. Uh, so, uh, and, and later on, um, objects were removed from the exhibition galleries and placed in so-called study rooms. And this is an example of the Rijksmuseum where you see that this is the first kind of storage facility within the museum itself to take out objects that were not required in the exhibition galleries, but should still be preserved. In later days, the museum got their storage facilities up in the towers of the Rijksmuseum. I do not know if you know the building, but it's a kind of neoclassical buildings with six towers. And what you see from these images that in between 1950 and 1969, for our most prestigious museum in the country, basically the uh, storage facilities within the building did not change at all. And it was in 1969 when the museum was closed for renovations. Collections needed to be removed and put into new uh, storage facility. And that was a temporary storage facility. And because of that, a completely new building was being built and that I will discuss later. So this is an overview of the buildings that we uh, visited. And the, uh, the very difficult uh, uh, name of this uh, little building here, Meta showed it also, it is called the Collection Center. Luckily, my Dutch is a little bit better. Um, uh, it's one of the examples that I will show. Given uh, my 45 minutes for this presentation, it is impossible to go into details of each and every one of those. But at the end of this presentation, I will give you some hope that you will also be able to get more details about this. So let's start at the, um, the storage facility that was built in 2001, or it was opened in 2001 in the city center of Amsterdam for the maritime collection. And at those days, this was the state of the art collection center. And I will show you briefly some images. Hey, that's weird. Okay, you can see it backwards now. If you play. Um, the building was built as a box in box construction. You can see that here on the left, we have the storage uh, rooms and this is the outer facade of concrete with a, uh, a steel structure on the outside. In the beginning, it was uh, positioned in the area where um, our Navy had its grounds. So it was protected by the military. So in terms of safety, it was extremely safe and difficult to access. And here, just uh, uh, the big storage room on the first floor. And there were two large HVAC systems providing air directly into the boxes where the uh, objects were placed. Uh, and again, in those days, this was seen as uh, the most wonderful building that one could have. And here you see a schematic cross section of the building, where you see that, first of all, the bandwidth that should be maintained, the climate within the storage rooms was pre pretty tight. It was important to, uh, for all these ship models to be uh, not exposed to large fluctuations of relative humidity and temperature. So that was the reason why they built these boxes. And each box was fitted with climatized air from individual systems that were placed in the ceiling. And this was typically in those days that all these HVAC systems ended up on top of the building. I will return to that later. 
Um, when we visited the, um, the storage facility, the ratio of ventilation air and recirculation was about 30% to 70%. So this means that the museum considered the, uh, uh, the inlet of fresh air from the outside as a very important uh, measure. Uh, and we should realize that in thinking about the ratio of these two, that this part of the air is not here for objects. Museum objects, they don't really need fresh air. They might need clean air, uh, but they don't need outside air. I will return to this later. Uh, a little bit later, um, two different uh, um, storage facilities were opened also in Amsterdam. Uh, in, in the white here, in 2009, we have the large facility for the Museum of Contemporary Art in Amsterdam. And this was uh, the uh, collection center for the Amsterdam Museum, which is basically the historic museum of Amsterdam. And they uh, created uh, an off-site storage in the northern part of the city. Um, and if we look at some, uh, some details, um, you can see that the building has a quite a rare, strange kind of shape. Um, there are, uh, uh, I think, about 13 different HVAC systems to climatize individual <coughs> storage rooms. Uh, and then uh, you see uh, the image of the uh, paintings, the storage, uh, and uh, the silver collection is given an extra layer of protection by applying plastic sheeting uh, that is uh, sealed. So in order to prevent pollution to reach uh, the objects. Um, now, if we look at the cross section of this building, first of all, you can see that again, the HVAC systems are placed on top of the building. This is also the case for the Museum of uh, uh, the Contemporary Art. Uh, so the whole climatization is based on HVAC. And HVAC means it's cooling, heating, humidification, and dehumidification all in one big system in order to make these specifications for the different rooms. Obviously, within this building, there's also a cold room for the plastics collection, and there is a dry room for the metal collection. So these are, these are the general... Uh, specifications. Uh, and in this building, the ratio of ventilation over recirculation is slightly more, let's say, optimistic and uh, sustainable, one could almost say. Um, but still, we could uh, question ourselves and wonder, you know, do we really need this 7% or could we even reduce that? Now, here is this, uh, this collection center in, uh, in Leeuwarden. And um, this was the, uh, the building that was presented by Meta and that was, had a completely different approach of climatization. It was the first example of a passive building. And um, let me show you, it was opened in 2016 um, and it contains three large rooms. And each of these rooms uh, are individually climatized by a small, relatively small system that hangs inside the room. Uh, and the air is distributed alongside the wall and ceiling to the outer edges of the room. And it's a high space. It's about, uh, yeah, I, I have to estimate like 14 meters or something like that. So it's basically like two stories high. And in uh, one, uh, two of the uh, rooms, they created these uh, inner floors to have an extra layer. Um, now, uh, you've already seen this, this the image, how uh, the, the building was climatized. Uh, but to give you a little bit more detail, um, it's all about the ground. So basically, if we... Uh, build a house in the Netherlands, we always isolate the floor because there's too much cold coming from uh, the ground. So for this building, the ground 
was the thermal mass that was required. And this idea of using thermal mass, of using the ground as a cooling system, basically, was taken from the Danish uh, group from the National Museum in Copenhagen uh, that created many different storage facilities using this uh, model. Now, so if you put a concrete building without any insulation on the ground floor, so there is direct contact between the inner volume through the concrete and the ground, you have a huge thermal mass and thermal mass Therm is uh, slow. So whenever, you know, the outside climate uh, changes and temperature between summer and winter change, you could find a way to use this thermal mass to have a more slowly seasonal adaptation of your climate inside. So what do you do? You insulate the whole building on the outside. So you create a huge layer of insulation. And basically it's like, you know, if you have a teapot in the old days, you put a layer on top of your teapot. So you also have hot tea two hours later. This is the same idea. And then you add some dehumidification and that's it. There are no other requirements uh, to stabilize the relative humidity indoors because the temperature changes really slowly. And as a result of this very slow change of temperature, the relative humidity maintains quite stable. Uh, but since uh, uh, humidities go up in summer, we need some dehumidification. Uh, some, one aspect that I did not uh, mention yet, that this is an extremely airtight building. So a lot of attention has been paid to all kinds of details on the outer facade of the concrete to seal all the seams between concrete uh, blocks to really make it an airtight building. So there's a lot of detailing of the building facade. Um, so annually we reach about 11 degrees Celsius uh, because of the, uh, the Dutch climate. Uh, and of course there are solar panels uh, to um, provide the energy required for the dehumidification. So basically this is the idea. Now this idea was also used for other uh, ideas on, on new storage facilities that are to be built, but the project stopped. And in that project, we uh, carefully looked at the relation between this zone, the storage zone, and this is basically offices and uh, project uh, spaces like photography, etc., cetera, um, and quarantine and the loading docks. Uh, and we carefully reconsidered the insulation between these two because we found with a, uh, the insulation that was on the outer facade was not continued between the offices, that there was some extra insulation and sustainability to be gained. And this building runs on 100% recirculation. So there's no outdoor air coming in. And the reason for that is that it is a huge space. Uh, and of course, I said already, fresh air is needed for people. If a lot of people work in such spaces, the CO2 levels go up, people get a bit nauseous and, and uh, don't feel comfortable. So we people require fresh air. But the idea is that uh, basically when you enter a space so big, you take the fresh air with you when you enter. So the door procedures provide the fresh air. And those are always limited volumes, of course. So there's a relatively little disturbance of the inner air in such a building. Now let's talk about the two large projects that were delivered in 2020. This is called the Collection Center Netherlands. And this is a huge building. It's enormous. It's a shared facility of a uh, shared uh, storage facility for the Rijksmuseum collection, the open air museum collection, the Royal collections and the state collections, which is part of the Institute where I work. 
So uh, I do not know the numbers of floor area. Those details can be easily found if you would, are interested in those. I'll give you the reference later. But it's, it's a huge building. It looks like, uh, like this. So here you, uh, you see the, uh, an aerial view of the building. So here's uh, one of the two loading docks. This is one loading dock. This is another loading dock. And basically the building is uh, built of three different zones. So um, we have what we call a head. So it's basically the head. This is the neck. And this is the torso. And in the torso, this is where the, the, uh, the storage spaces are situated. Here in the middle, in the neck area, that is where we work with collections. So there is a photography, conservation treatment, project spaces, everything. And here in the offices, this is where security levels are slightly lower. There's more open access, but there's no collection there. So by differentiating these zones, you can control the climate, you can control safety. Uh, there's a lot of uh, things you could do. You, for example, uh, during evenings, uh, there are large doors that are closed between these uh, two spaces. There's no electricity within the big building, none whatsoever. There's no machinery in that building. So no uh, uh, like uh, trucks that are needed to, to lift stuff or some kind of hand tools that people need to work with collections. It's not allowed. So every night, everything is outside and there's only collection in there and there's a little bit of climatization, but I'll come to that later. Uh, so here are some impressions again, but you've seen many photos of storage rooms already, but it's kind of similar. You have big objects on the ground floor. You have smaller objects on uh, the lower or on the higher floors. We have a huge elevator because obviously you always look at your biggest object that is supposed to be, a, to, to be able to go upstairs. And that is determining the size of your elevator. So there are two elevators, a small one and a really big one. And then um, something to pay attention to. This is also um, implemented in the collection center in, that I showed earlier. Here you see that we have these uh, sliding racks, but for two floors. So these cabinets they are connected. Basically, if you rotate this one, this will also shift. And this creates an even more high density uh, storage because there's no concrete slab here. So the reduction of cost of building cost is quite significant by creating uh, spaces over two floors and then create use uh, the sliding racks uh, over both spaces. So what does the climatization look like? Well, obviously there are solar panels on the roof. It's a big roof, it's huge. I don't know how many solar panels they have, but they have like 2000 of them or something like that. Then, of course, they have not an insulated ground slab. So again, thermal mass is important. So the concrete is insulated from the outside. It's a huge package. I've been on the roof of the building and the insulation was this high. This is all the insulation on the roof. So it's a huge package of insulation. And the insulation itself was placed in such a way, it was this high, because they wanted to have a runoff of water. And since the building is really big, you need the height in the center to have that uh, possibility. Here you see for the first time that the HVAC systems, or it's not HVAC, it's really small, uh, are placed not on in the attic, but they're placed on the side. And the, the, the floors between these systems are all great floors. They're all open. So if there is some kind of leakage or issue here, it all drops down to the ground. This is really nice because in these other facilities like this one, maintenance personnel needed to go through the storage facility up into the attic to reach the HVAC system. Here, they basically do not enter the storage room at all. So here you can quite easily remove parts and deal with the systems. 
Um, and then there's one other aspect that they created in this space, and that is what we call a core cooling of the concrete. It is a little bit like floor heating. So they inserted uh, these uh, hoses inside the concrete, and there's cold water running through the system. And the cold water just comes from the ground. And by doing so, you basically cool the concrete. And of course, if you cool concrete, this is a really slow process. So there is no sudden uh, increase or decrease of temperature. And as a result of that, a huge or sudden increase or decrease of relative humidity. So this building, my colleague Wim Hube, who is the manager of this building, he refers to this as an, an ocean steamship, like a huge ship. And it has a little out, outer motor. You know, if you have a little boat, a fishing boat, you have such a little out motor. That's what this is. You have a huge building, but very limited possibilities to steer the climate in a direction. So the building should act as the shell to maintain or stabilize the, especially the temperature and a little bit of humidity. Um, also, you can see that the boundaries for relative humidity are slightly wider. They're even wider than the specifications for the Rijksmuseum itself. So at this moment, the Rijksmuseum is reconsidering their specifications because they have three different locations where objects are being placed. They have the, the big museum building in the city center. They have the, uh, the building where I work that we share with the workshops of Rijksmuseum, which is uh, uh, typically 55 plus or minus 5%. And they have this building as a shared storage facility. And because in each of these locations, they had different specifications, they said, we need to revisit this subject and we will widen the specifications. And I sincerely hope that this will also result in the widening of our loaning requirements for objects nationally and internationally, but that is a very different subject. So for this building, uh, there is some, uh, uh, some ventilated air. And this has to do with the fact that the people at the Rijksmuseum find it really important to be able to work long-term inside the storage rooms. Uh, another aspect that came into, into play when we were considering the climate in this building was the friends of the museum. Because the museum has many friends that donate money, sometimes objects to the museum. They are an important stakeholder group. And, and these people, although they are wearing furs, they find fresh air very important. So uh, there you see that sometimes decisions are not only based on object preservation or costs or sustainability uh, ambitions. Sometimes they're just based on other types of uh, uh, needs like the Friends of the Museum. And now, last but not least, we have the new storage facility of Boymans van Beuningen. This is a, a building uh, located in the city center of Rotterdam. It's an iconic building. Uh, I do not know if you've been to Rotterdam recently, but if you've been, you cannot miss it. It's a huge building. It's about eight floor stories high. It's completely, uh, uh, the outer facade is completely uh, uh, covered by mirror glass. So if you are standing here, you can make a very nice photograph of yourself in the city of Rotterdam. Um, you, in the uh, mirror image, you can see the, uh, the museum itself. This is the tower of the museum, Boymans van Beuningen. So it's only like a hundred meters away, but still, you know, transport needs to be done with, uh, um, yeah, the best quality means, trucks. And you can buy tickets to visit this building because the building has been built in such a way that if you, if you buy a ticket, you get a white coat, you make you look like a doctor. Uh, it gives you a kind of special feeling that's, oh, now I'm gonna go somewhere, this is really special. And they do tours, I think like uh, six times every hour. And they visit every tour goes a different route. So if you're lucky, you get into the, uh, the circular uh, paintings uh, uh, storage room. If you're unlucky, you just get to see the metals or something like that. 
Uh, but the uh, inner corridor where these people are standing, this is like seven stories high. And this is like, a, 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 what is it called? The Harry Potter castle, where you see all these stairs that go all every direction. And it's really wonderfully designed for people to be able to see and enjoy the objects. And it's like a, a, the other example uh, from you, Irene, uh, where you uh, uh, said that you also have private collections in the building and also here, private people can hire a space, which is not only a storage space, but there's also a little exhibition space. So they can actually build their own exhibition within the room. And there are about seven of those sets of rooms, storage plus exhibition within the building to facilitate these private collections or collectors. So let's have a look. Uh, the climatization of this building is really different. So it depends fully on climate control with machinery. Um, although they have solar panels and they have cold and hot water storage in the ground, uh, they are considering a, a really strict climate. So basically for me, it's kind of stepping back in time but they, uh, they uh, preserve uh, modern collections and uh, um, collections that we, are, we don't know so much about, like uh, materials that like a 3D printed objects, we do not know so much about it, uh, modern design objects. Um, but the climate system is based on three different air streams where we have uh, uh, that, that are mixed later to create some kind of an environment. Again, I will not go into much uh, detail uh, on that. Um, oh, I make the same mistake as I did earlier, but you can see I'm almost there. Okay. So here we have more ventilation because of the groups that are visiting uh, the building. So how can we look at these buildings? Now we've seen all these buildings, they all function and they're all built in different times. Um, we can look at access over energy or, or costs or whatever. And we can place all these buildings uh, somewhere where we say, okay, we have the older buildings that consume a lot of energy uh, and basically they are not very accessible only to museum staff. And if you make a real appointment, then you can go, uh, but that's uh, uh, there. If you uh, take the new buildings like CCNL, it's a little bit more accessible. It, it, it uh, uses uh, much less energy. Uh, and then we have Boymans on top. It's very accessible, but it also uses uh, quite some energy. We can look at, uh, you know, who provided the funds for these buildings. So we have municipal museums, or let's say small regional museums. They, they are being designed and built with very different funding than if we would compare them to provincial museums or even state museums. So if we compare buildings, we have to think a little bit about who paid for this and what are their ambitions also. Uh, and that explains also if you, if you build something in the city center of Rotterdam, it is gonna be an iconic building. But if you put it somewhere in the province, you can make anything you like because it doesn't need to look so good. Um, so what kind of trends can we see? Well, first thing is thermal insulation. In the old days, the older buildings are all built in, in the way that basically the thermal mass is on the inside and the insulation or on the outside and insulation is on the inside. Nowadays, we build with insulation on the outside. And just to make the point again, if we wanna use the, the thermal mass of the building, we have to consider the ground floor temperature. So in the Netherlands annually, that is like uh, 11 degrees. So again, just to repeat, it looks like this. Um, we need to think about uh, the ratio of recirculation over ventilation. So in the old days, there was a lot of fresh air being brought in for people that are working in these spaces. And nowadays, more and more we say go for 100% recirculation. Alternatively, one could say, okay, I'm gonna design my building in this way, but I'm gonna limit my ventilation by uh, setting up a CO2 sensor. 
So the amount of ventilation air is only uh, added to the inside air when the CO2 sensor tells you to do it. So then CO2 is the telltale to uh, add air. Um, and of course the process, how we derive at buildings uh, differed. In the old days, it started with an architect. And the architect, of course, as Mate also explained, they gather a lot of information, but at the end of the day, the, the general process of the project looked like this. You create a building, you add your furniture, and then you put in your objects. And this was the example of the Amsterdam Museum, where there are many different spaces that are not effectively used because the shape of the building was kind of weird. Uh, so you end up with a lot of dead space. Um, nowadays, we start with the collection, especially uh, typically like uh, Meta explained to you, you calculate your objects, your uh, volumes, and you create the furniture around your collection. And then you build a building around your collection furniture. So the, re the relation between the people that are providing you the furniture and the architect is extremely important. There needs to be a really close connection there because this will prevent a lot of dead space. So high density storage uh, is important. And as an example uh, of high density storage, one could look at the building layout and we've seen examples of that in earlier <laughs> presentations. Uh, but here we have these, uh, uh, instead of having two spaces on top of each other separated by a concrete floor. We design a building without a concrete floor and you add a creating floor, but you have these cabinets that go over two stories. You see it here in the CCNL again. So everything is reachable, but the costs of build is, is lower. Now, uh, I told you, that uh, I, I cannot go into too much detail. So if you want to learn more about, uh, you know, what was the price of these buildings or what does it cost per object or um, how, what, is, what was the typical volume of these uh, storage facilities, you can find all these details in this publication. I think it's a, a free access. It's a publication by ICOM. It's called Museum International. And basically we wrote a, a paper of our findings uh, and um, uh, it's, it's like a management summary. It's a high density uh, information, but uh, it might be helpful. And because we really liked uh, the publication, we decided to, uh, uh, to uh, create a booklet. So we asked uh, different uh, collection managers to write a chapter on their storage facility. And at this moment, this book is being translated into English and this will be available on our website, I think somewhere in, in three or four months time at the most. So uh, there will be uh, more information uh, available. Now to uh, conclude my uh, story, I think um, much of our thinking about the climate derives from the moment when collections were put inside quarries during the Second World War. And this is a photograph from the, uh, music, the National Gallery in London, where they put their collections in the Manet Quarry in Wales to protect it from war activities. And uh, it turned out that this was an extremely stable climate. So conservators that were used to treat cracking panels continuously were out of work within a few years. This thinking about the climate this experience resulted in large HVAC systems in museums and in storage facilities. But nowadays, we try to step away from these systems and return to these quarries, where you see that the building is being designed in such a way to mimic these quarries. So you can see that there's a lot of insulation you can even see here the lining of uh, the, the ceiling of the seams between concrete uh, panels. Um, so there's a lot of detailing in the facade to create something that we already had like many decades ago. 
So I thank the organizers for inviting me to give this lecture and I thank you for your uh, attention. <laughs>